Um, so tonight we actually have a really fun webinar for you, as if you couldn't tell. Uh, we have Howard Purcell from Essilor here to talk all about the Essilor and Coastal.com uh, acquisition. And as, as I mentioned to Howard before this call started, Paul has absolutely no idea what's going on. Absolutely. I, I, I did show up because ordinarily I don't come to webinars. I listen like the rest of the audience and try really to stay awake for the whole hour. Uh, many times I, I really don't make it through, but for this particular one, I guarantee that everyone will be staying awake. Yep, and <laughs> and so you know, Paul takes things from the the, the point of view of the clinician. Um, I when I heard about this deal, I sort of put my MBA hat on and started to think about, well, why? Why do this? You know, what what's going on here? It's not a snap decision that people make or companies make. Um, and so there's there's usually a very good reason behind a merger. Usually it's it's not you know something nefarious or empire building or anything else. There's usually a very good reason to do it. And tonight we're very fortunate to have Howard here to actually walk us through and tell us all about it and, and what it's going to mean to everyone. So with all that said, Howard, uh, why don't you take it away? Well, thank you very much, Adam. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. And there's probably a lot of folks out there I don't know, so maybe I could say two seconds. I am an optometrist, uh, practiced in private practice in South Florida. Uh, for about 10 years with my father, who certainly inspired me and schooled me on the importance of independent practice and what it contributes, and just being uh, optometry and being independent. I think that really represents all of us. Uh, I spent five years at uh, Nova Southeastern at the College of Optometry. Okay, and, let me interrupt uh, you right there, Howard, oh, because right. at this particular point, that's where I met Howard. We, we both were on the faculty of Nova Southeastern, and Howard... Uh, he, he's very modest, but he probably was the most favorite professor there. The students absolutely adored him. Uh, and, uh, very kind of you, Paul. I appreciate yeah, that. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> they saw that young face of Howard versus me, but uh, they, they knew. <laughs> they, they knew who to like. Uh, and uh, Howard uh, left uh, Nova Southeastern for, uh, to become a uh, uh, to go into industry and become uh, someone that was an ombudsman for optometry. Uh, basically, he was the voice of optometry first uh, with, with Vista Khan, which Howard will tell you about, and then on to Essilor. Uh, and I went on, to, I left uh, Nova Southeastern, and uh, I ended up just being a troublemaker and a curmudgeon on OD Wire. So I, <laughs> Howard ended up with a much more successful career, I can assure you. <laughs> okay, Howard, take it away again. <laughs> Sorry. How do I follow that? How do I follow that? No, I'm not so sure about the successful part, but uh, certainly have enjoyed the opportunities I've had. And I really bring that up primarily because it's given me a unique perspective uh, on the profession, having been in uh, independent practice, having been in academia, now in industry. Um, it's really been an interesting ride for me. And I think in setting this up, I, I, it's probably appropriate to talk a little bit about kind of what drives me as I try to be the best representative of optometry that I can be within Essilor. Um, you know, for me, it's important to kind of look at what are the things that are really having the biggest impact on the profession? What are those key influences on the eye care practitioner's practice? And really determine what those are. And, and for where I sit, and it's, it's a little bit unique, and so I'm just trying to give that perspective, we really can't wait to see what happens. We can't kind of sit back and say, okay, let's wait and see, let's react. As a leader in the industry, we really feel a greater responsibility than that. We have to make commitments. We have to make the best decisions that we can. And, and I guess I would say, you know, others are going to judge us on how well we've done at preparing us for the future, meaning Essilor and, and uh, optometry and eye care practitioners. Uh, but for me, we've got to try things. We've got to test. We've got to experiment. We're not going to always be right. We may not always make the most popular decisions on the surface, but to me, an absolute worst case scenario is stagnation. So as a leader, we really take that seriously. And I think sometimes decisions we make uh, with our viewpoint can be viewed a little bit differently when you're sitting out there in the field. And believe me, I appreciate that. And I try to think about that as often as I can and, and bring that perspective as best I can to, to Essilor. To me, bottom line, we can't let others shape our industry for us. We need to invent the future together. And if I could just kick it off with a thought, that's to me the key. We, we really can't. I've attended, and many of you, I'm sure of the folks listening, have attended the Global Leadership Summit that uh, is put on by Jobs, and they do a wonderful job there. And it's really all the people disrupting and, and doing things coming from outside our industry primarily and really affecting in a pretty big way what we do. I, I don't miss that meeting, and it's one that I'm taking copious notes and really, really trying to understand how do I position the company I represent and the people I represent. And I take that responsibility very seriously. Uh, to prepare for the future. So I just want to set up what we're about to talk about 
with that. We got to try, we got to test, we have to experiment, we've got to do those things. And some of them are going to be right, some of them are wrong. And like I said, you know, we'll be judged on how well we do. I, I'd like to think so far we've done pretty well, uh, but we're going to make mistakes. There's no question. You know, when you take risks, you put yourself out there and you can make mistakes. But honestly, I feel like what's happening right now in the industry, there's just immense change taking place. And as a result, we really have to test and try and look at different things. So with that, um, Maybe we can dive right in, unless you guys had anything else you wanted to say before I kick it off here. Well, well the only thing that uh, we, we, everyone in the audience, if you're new to the webinar, is you can ask questions while Howard is speaking, and then we will gather the questions and ask at the end. And no holds barred, so uh, you, we won't know who's asking the questions. Uh, it'll be anonymous, so you can feel free to ask anything you wish, and uh, we will uh, transcribe it. We'll, we will discuss it after the uh, presentation is over. Anything else, Ed? No, that, that was pretty clear. So I guess, Howard, take it away. Off we go. So uh, the first slide here, just kind of giving you an overview of what I'd like to try to get into a little bit. But certainly, for me, the important thing is to try to address questions. But if you give me a chance to kind of talk through the story a little bit, hopefully I can answer some of those questions and then maybe inspire a few others. So uh, what I'd like to do is just give a little introduction to what's happened with this acquisition. I think you used the term merger, so just to be clear, it is an acquisition. Um, you know, who is Coastal a little bit? I've learned a lot about this company uh, over the past uh, several months. I've had a long time to think about this, so it's uh, been an interesting ride for me. Um, I thought it might be appropriate just to remind folks kind of who Essilor is, just very briefly as a company, you know, what we represent, who we are. Uh, why e-commerce and our view uh, of the internet as a tool, and then um, changes that uh, are in store, which I think, uh, you know, I, I thank you guys for, for giving me the opportunity to share. And, uh, you know, it starts off with just, you know, acknowledging we have owned this company for 48 hours. <laughs> so I just want to make that clear for just a moment. Um, and although we've had some time to, to think a lot about it, uh, the really full ownership has only been for 48 hours. It's been a, a tough road for me, I have to say, because, you know, as you see here, we, we announced the plan to enter into an acquisition back in February. But as you can imagine, there's so many steps and shareholder agreements and things that have to happen. We really had to be very silent about some of the things that we wanted to do until that process uh, completed. And, uh, and Paul, you know me pretty well. That's a hard thing for me. I had a lot of things I wanted to say. I had a lot of things I wanted to talk to my colleagues about. And uh, as soon as possible, we were doing that. So here we are, 48 hours into it. So this just gives you a, a quick overview of kind of how, how things have taken place. The important thing is the acquisition was finalized. Uh, 48 hours ago and here we are uh, trying to make sure first of all we're out there talking to you I want to let, let the team know and let the people know who are listening in that we have an advisory panel that is talking to us on a regular basis now and, and helping us through this process of what I would consider to be some of the most respected practitioners uh, in, in the industry and in, I shouldn't say the industry but in the profession um, just excited for that opportunity and have received some incredible feedback already on a direction and, and some good thoughts and ideas. So I just wanted to make that clear just timing wise. Would have loved to, back in February when the initial announcement came out, been able to tell everything about the things we're thinking about, have dialogue. It just wasn't possible. So here we are today with a great opportunity and thanks to you guys, an opportunity to engage a lot of my colleagues uh, tonight. So with that, um, a little bit just brief on Coastal. I think a lot of folks know about Coastal, primarily the things we've heard about Coastal as optometrists maybe have not necessarily been very positive, but just top line, you know, high level, they're a major online retailer of eyewear. Uh, they serve uh, multiple markets, as you can see, the US, Canada, Sweden, Japan. I'll give you a little idea of how that breaks up in just a minute in terms of their business. Uh, certainly their primary business is contact lenses. That's what they've done for many years. That's what I think most practitioners know them for. Uh, they have started to, to, to try to work in the eyeglass area, um, but has been a, a small part of the business to date. Um, one thing they do have going from their strong consumer brand, uh, they have strong consumer brand equity, uh, their popularity with consumers as you see is very strong, social media, they've, they've really done a nice job in the social media space, so their recognition with the consumer is, is uh, pretty high. You see there a little bit of their uh, revenue um, in, in 2013. And as I think most people know, they do operate uh, both in Canada and the U.S. In, in slightly different formats with regard to their uh, websites. So pretty straightforward. I think most everybody's familiar with that. Uh, with that. Um, by the numbers wise, this may be not as familiar to folks, but as you can see, uh, about 70-30 uh, split in terms of contact lenses and eyeglasses to date. And by region, you know, this may come as a surprise to some people um, that uh, not so much that they're 
the bulk of their business uh, or a third of their business is done in Canada, but a uh, second of that is represented by really other parts of the world, about 20% in Sweden, about 10% in Norway, and as you see, about 15% in the U.S. So that's kind of how their sales break up, just an idea a little bit more about the company and uh, sort of what it looks like. Other things you should know, which uh, over the past 48 hours, I think a lot of people do know because I've heard from a lot of my friends and colleagues. Um, may, maybe some people don't know how aggressive, but they did have a very aggressive plan to grow their bricks and mortar stores through, throughout North America to the tune of triple digits uh, in a very rapid manner. Um, they did, as I've learned more and more about over the past several months, work in Canada in support of the deregulation of eye health. Um, they do have uh, currently a first uh, payer free initiative. Uh, the intent was to drive consumers to their site. And uh, probably the most interesting part for me, and I think biggest opportunity that exists here, they have about a million uh, in their customer database, about 200 million within the past two years. That, that's a big number and one that certainly got our attention as we began to dig a little bit deeper into uh, the coastal business. So, um, if I may, I'd just like to take two minutes to, to speak just a bit about Eslor, its mission. Um, you know, generally, we come to work every day. We try not to talk about we make lenses. We try not to talk about we do lab services. We try to talk about what we do to make uh, lives better and to improve sight with the partnership of our ECP uh, colleagues. And that, that's really what drives us. Uh, we don't make a little uh, a widget that doesn't do anything for people or for humankind. We make something that really makes a difference for people. And if you walk around the building here at Essilor, I think you feel that. It's, uh, for me, one of the many things I really like about our company is our desire to kind of act like a small entrepreneurial company. It, it's what truly drives us. We're, we're still learning how to do that, and it's, it's not real easy with the size we are. But through the leadership of John Carrier, who's just an amazing leader, uh, you know, it's certainly never a dull moment. I work with a, a truly amazing group of people here at Essilor. So um, I'd like to just give you a little reminder of some things. We are the world leader in ophthalmic optics, uh, lenses, lab services, lab equipment. Uh, um, supply chain, it's some, some of the strengths of our organization. Uh, been around for a while, as you can see, uh, innovation is really what we're about. We're very proud that that innovation has been recognized by Forbes, uh, by uh, being recognized as one of the most sustainable corporations. And um, we probably one of the things I take the greatest pride in is we do third party studies every year, <clears throat> excuse me, and comparing ourselves in the industry. This is done not by Essilor, but by an independent group. And, we continue to be noted as the most trusted partner in the industry. That is something that is truly important to us and uh, something we do not take lightly and uh, are very, very proud of that, but uh, uh, strive to assure that uh, everything we do continues to build on that trust. And that's something you can't buy. Trust is something that's a pretty special attribute that doesn't come easily. So we're extremely excited uh, to continue to see how well we do there and we thank uh, those who support us uh, for, for viewing Essilor in that manner and we will continue to do everything we can to maintain that. So those are pretty pretty important things for us. For the numbers, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but just to give you some idea, we have 55,000 employees plus around the world. Um, we have, uh, as you see, about 450 laboratories and, and edging facilities. 28 uh, production plants worldwide. These are global numbers, by the way. Uh, three innovation and technology centers. Very proud that uh, in the past couple of years we've opened up uh, a technology center here in Dallas in the U.S., so the first one we've had here in the U.S., which brings the whole innovation process a lot closer to us. And uh, that has really, I think, done a lot to assure that our customer, the eye care practitioner's input, is included into everything that we do in terms of innovation. And it's something we, we, we are... Uh, very focused, laser focused on, if I may say. Um, and then, you know, you're going to see a lot of new products from Essilor. It, it's something that we believe in. We believe innovation is critical. We believe if we don't continue to innovate, uh, that will not be a good thing for the industry. Uh, but we hope we can innovate with things that do make a difference. And that's what we strive for. And, you know, I'm going to say it here. I'm going to say it throughout. Um, I am, you know, the optometric representative, the eye care practitioner representative here at Essilor, ophthalmology, optometry, opticianry. Um, I need to hear from you. If I don't hear from you, I'm not doing my job well. Uh, to sit in Dallas all day for me and not engage with my colleagues, which is, is certainly not my, uh, my approach, uh, would not allow me to be at all valuable here. So I hope not only tonight with the folks that are listening, and I appreciate that very much, but that I'm happy to leave at the end with my email address and I would welcome anyone to contact me, tell me how they feel and, and what they like about what we're doing, what they don't like, what they'd like to see us do. Uh, thereby, I'd be, uh, I can be a better asset and, and resource uh, 
Um, I do have a voice at the highest level here at Essilor. I'm proud of that. And as a result, that means that the eye care practitioner has a voice at the highest level here. So we need to take advantage of that. And that's the case for a lot of companies in our industry. I think that having been in a couple of them, I would suggest that the, uh, our colleagues maybe think that, wow, oh, they're just one voice and what's the big deal? So they don't always take the time to call us and let us know how they feel. But those of you who do, uh, I can tell you it's taken extremely seriously and I would encourage more of you to do so, whether it be something that really aggravates you or something that really pleases you or a gap that you see that, that needs to be filled. So I'll come back to that, but that's, that's an important one. If there's a few things I'd like to have folks leave with tonight, that would be certainly one key one. So, you know, thank you for the opportunity just for a minute to get into a little bit of, of, of my company and the company I'm part of and very proud to be part of. So, so why e-commerce? Um, if I had to really boil everything down, Adam, Paul, you know, I, and I had to say, you know, I'm in a, an elevator with somebody and someone says, why the heck did you do this? And, and what's this about? And, and why make a move to e-commerce? Um, to me, it really boils down to a simple statement. And, and I'm going to dive in a little bit of this to try to clarify it. But for me, the buying process, and if we just talk about e-commerce in general, we can look at both our space, but even outside of our space. The more you read, and I've been studying this candidly for over five years. We launched my online optical for, you know, probably going on five and a half years ago now. To me, the buying process is becoming an omni-channel experience, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. The independent practitioner is the bricks and mortar component of that omni-channel solution. That, to me, is at the heart of this. If we think about ourselves as a consumer, omni-channel essentially means the consumer today wants to have the options of a bricks and mortar along with a virtual input. And by the way, if we even look at the pure numbers, and the Vision Council does a great job with this, today about 3.5% of consumers are buying eyewear online. The big number, though, and the one I want folks to, to think a little bit more about is approximately 40% of consumers are going online before they come to our office to educate themselves. So today to me, e-commerce or e-solutions are a lot more about education than they are about commerce. However, that will continue to evolve. And there's a great article, and I'm, I'm happy to send you guys some details, but if anybody wants to read a little bit more, it's a great article that I have read probably 10 times now. It's called The State of Omnichannel Retail. It's written by Yuri. Yermser. So the last name is W-U-R-M-S-E-R. -E it's a fantastic article that takes, I think, a very objective look at omni-channel and what it means. And, and let's, let's add one other fact to this. If you look at the pure virtual players that are out there today, and we all know who they are, their names we hear talked about quite frequently. Observe what trend you're seeing there. The trend you're seeing there is that they've recognized that a pure virtual player is not really going to win today. And in fact, those who've said we would never open up bricks and mortar stores are opening bricks and mortar stores. Now, I would suggest to you, if I may, that as uncomfortable as we were at the beginning in trying to even wrap our arms around e-commerce, what that was all about, how to implement it, should we implement it, I would suggest to you the e-commerce, the pure e-commerce players are just as uncomfortable with the whole idea of bricks and mortar. It's what we do best. It's what we understand. But the consumer is saying, and I think they're speaking fairly loudly, and the more you read, the more you see that, that I want the options. I want to learn more. I want to go online. I want to be educated. So I walk in as a much more educated consumer. Think about yourself. And occasionally, I think we have to put that consumer hat on and think a little bit about ourselves as a consumer. We do the same thing. In the article I suggested, you'll see some information about, I hear a lot about this showrooming uh, uh, concept, where people come in, they try on a pair of glasses, they take measurements, they get the information, they go home and buy. Well, this article suggests something very interesting, that it's called webrooming. And it's actually just the opposite of showrooming. It's actually saying quite the opposite. I get online. I educate myself and I go in and buy. Particularly in our space, folks are consumers really want that safety net of feeling like if they need an adjustment, if they have a question, and they're really demanding it. And we're seeing that by some of the movement that's being made by some of the big players in this space. So the web rooming really is what you'll see the folks who are really knowledgeable in this space are suggesting is the future, not so much showrooming. So I think we have a chance to really redefine what this channel of trade will become. I think it has a lot more today to do with education than commerce, and we are the best to do that educating. I talk to a lot of consumers. I have that opportunity and where I sit, 
And what consumers are saying, generally speaking, is I want to stay with my current doctor, but I don't believe they offer, if they have an interest in, in the e-commerce space, I don't believe they offer that, so I feel like I have to go elsewhere. We have this inherent advantage in the minds of the consumer that they would prefer to utilize us if they could, but they don't feel we've offered them opportunities. So I would suggest to you today, e-commerce today is a lot more about education than it is about commerce. Will it be about commerce more and more? Perhaps. But will people continue to appreciate the value of having that safety net? I think they're speaking pretty loudly right now and saying that that's the case as we see those who said they'd never get into that doing so. So our general beliefs here, um, there are ways to utilize the internet in a very positive way. I think we need to do it. It gets back to my comment about we can't just wait around and see, okay, will this become something? Will it not? How are we going to act? What are we going to do? We're going to tell people it's bad. Uh, I've seen that approach fail for us in the past, and I'd hate to see that happen again. So, you know, we need to increase the, the you know, our, our belief is that this helps to increase access to vision correction. The people who are coming online, and I think I've heard this from colleagues many times, that, you know, these are people who maybe don't appreciate as much the value of the eye exam, which gives us a wonderful opportunity to educate. You saw the numbers of people coming through, for example, the coastal site. This is an opportunity. To, to me, it's, it's a bit of a think about your eyes type of approach. It's making sure that people understand the value of the eye exam. I think we have the potential to really complement traditional distribution channels, which, you know, these words here, I mean, to me are very important. It, it is the only ones that are able to provide that added value, the direct care, taking measurements, supporting wearers. That, that's so critically important and really coming to the forefront in the minds of the consumer, more so candidly than ever before. Um, you know, I think we can enrich the experience uh, and simplify access to vision correction in many cases for people who would otherwise not have gotten it. So, you know, the consumer really, as I said earlier, it's about education, uh, it's, it's raising awareness, and that um, one key item that, that I just want to make clear, and, 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 you know, I know there are people who find us to uh, find it distasteful a bit uh, in the, on the surface of the decisions we've made here around coastal. But, but let me just say generally, and I know I speak for everyone at Essilor, we would prefer that all eyewear was dispensed across a dispensing pay table by a master optician. We wish that was the case. The problem is wishing that's the case and hoping that's the case versus addressing what's truly happening and what the consumer is demanding. And, and you know, in my career, I've certainly noted one thing and that is the ultimately the consumer wins what they want and what they desire is going to win so we can wish it we can hope it and I can tell you that that is our philosophy but the reality gets back to what I said we can't wait around we can't let others shape our industry for us we need to invent where the future is going and I believe we have a big opportunity when we say that only three and a half percent three point eight percent of eyewear is sold online it's still small we still have a big opportunity to really shape the direction of this channel. And that's truly what it is. It's a, it's a new channel of trade that candidly isn't going to go away and, and we're going to have to deal with it. And the sooner we do, in my humble opinion, the better. So I'd like to talk a little bit about some changes because um, it's something I've been wanting to say for several months. Uh, a lot of my friends and colleagues calling me, what are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about that? We don't like this. We don't like that. And I appreciate that input, believe me. So I want to be clear on a couple things. Uh, first of all, a simple one for, in terms of management. Uh, there'll be a new CEO of Coastal.com. The company will remain in Vancouver. Uh, most people, if you didn't attend the Global Leadership Summit, don't know Roy Hessel. But I'll tell you what, <laughs> we're awfully glad Roy's on our side of the fence on this one. Roy is a brilliant guy. He understands e-commerce. He's participated in it for most of his career. And have his, having Roy's perspective, having his intellect, he understands the professional side, he understands the e-commerce side, I think it puts us in a wonderful position to really take a leadership role in a way that I hope uh, our colleagues will feel good about. Uh, so as I said, there, there will be a change in leadership, so that's the first one I just wanted to, uh, to make sure that you're aware of. Uh, second, uh, the bricks and mortar side, and I want to be extremely clear on, that, on this, so I will read it. Essilor is immediately halting the growth plan for the bricks and mortar stores globally and will be looking for opportunities for divestiture of those existing properties. I want that to be very clear. We are not interested in owning bricks and mortar stores. That is not something that is part uh, of our direction, part of our strategy. Uh, yes, I appreciate when we made the acquisition, it was easy for folks to say, okay, they're our competitor now. They're out there with bricks and mortar stores. That is clearly, and I want to make that just crystal clear, we have no interest in that. We believe the bricks and mortar component 
of an omni-channel approach is the eye care practitioner. And we believe by partnering together, we could really make a big difference in addressing this new channel of trade and the demand that the consumer is putting on us, which, candidly, I know it. We don't love it, but it's here to stay, and, and we have to address it. And we have to address it in a, in a way that makes a big difference. And I think with this acquisition, it puts us in a great position to do that. Um, so just to be clear, Essilor relies on our customers for those doors. That, that is not an interest for us. We don't intend to own retail, retail stores directly competing with our, our eye care practitioners. That is not an interest for us. I mean, think about it. It's crazy for us to do something like that. This company was built and has grown around those small entrepreneurial eye care practitioners. For us to begin to compete in bricks and mortar just doesn't make sense. I mean, it's, it's not smart. It's not... Uh, appropriate and uh, isn't a good business decision in any way, shape, or form. So I just wanted to be clear about that. Um, as far as the free pair is concerned, I also want to try to do my best to be clear there. We will stop the program of giving away the first pair free. I mean, to us, this does not reflect the, the proper value of services. So clearly there are inconsistencies between the philosophy of our company, Essilor, and the philosophy of Coastal. And I hope that what my colleagues will see is both immediate, which you're seeing here, and gradually, uh, there will be changes made that will, and let me just say it this way. I, I'd like to think, in as humble as I can put this, that a, a coastal continuing as it was versus a coastal operated by Essilor, I'd like to prove to you and to our colleagues that that is the best thing that could happen in many ways. And, and my, my mission is to, to do my best to, to make sure that that happens. Um, we are diligent that, or, you know, I think, it's important to us to develop online sales in the optical industry, but it does not come at the expense of where safety, quality of correction, product performance. This has to be all about taking those huge number of people coming through the coastal site and helping them to understand the value of the eye exam, why that's so critical, driving them into offices. If it's at the expense of making a sale at coastal, that's okay. We're going to send them into eye care practitioner's office, help educate them on the importance. And there's actually a couple ideas we have that are still kind of being blended, and I'd love to share tonight, but it really builds around the concept of educating. And when some today, if, if a consumer shows up at an e-commerce site today, all they're trying to do is sell them something. Let me repeat those numbers. 3.8% buying, 40% want information. I mean, to me, that's a pretty straightforward deal. Let's give them some information. Let's educate them. It's what they're truly looking for. And today, they, they primarily wind up in places like WebMD, et cetera. We want to create a great vehicle and partnering with all the different groups out there to try to make sure that they understand, that the consumer understands, particularly those coming through these sites, the key value of the eye exam and its importance. So um, we're ending the free pair. As I said, that's important to us. Um, we're not going to continue to down the path of devaluing what eyewear is on any channel. And, uh, and when appropriate, certainly, we feel like you know, e-commerce can be a good solution for people who don't have access, for people who want something simple. I'll give you a great example of where I think it works really well. Sunwear, Plano Sunwear. Think about this for a minute. I think in general, optometry does not do a fabulous job, and maybe there's some people on, on the line here who probably do a great job. But as a whole, I've visited thousands of practices, we don't do a great job at selling sunwear. So think about the option, and I'll just tell you why. We talk to consumers about a lot. Primarily, the main reason is selection. So what if Mrs. Jones comes into the office, she looks, she wants a pair of sunglasses, she's a contact lens wearer, says, you know what, your selection's kind of small, or just says to you, you know what, can I have my prescription? What if you could say to Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones, we have an uh, opportunity to offer you every, every, sun, every pair of sunglasses available. Come over to our kiosk in our office or go to our website. We can offer you an unlimited, unlimited selection of sunwear. Um, this is just one example of where I see it working. I think in the simple, straightforward cases, not the, for me, not progressives, not uh, uh, specialty types of prescriptions, complex prescriptions. I don't see that as, as where this, this plays. And even when we've looked at where the sales are coming, it's not there. I see this as an opportunity and even just tipping your toes in the water as a practitioner to even look at sunwear and how, uh, what opportunities. And, and Essilor does offer, and we'll get to that in a minute, an opportunity for you tomorrow to turn on a, a site that could do that uh, turnkey for your patients. So I think just one example of where we could create some opportunities from the beginning. Um, as far as product availability, uh, and this has been our philosophy from the beginning, so uh, you know, hopefully people appreciate that. that uh, we, know, we acquired Frames Direct. One of the first things we did was take Verilux off of there. We continue to have a consistent policy around Verilux, um, around Crizol. Um, that Those are just products that we've always uh, maintained uh, as products for 
the independent practitioner. Um, hopefully folks know we're now on TV with Verilux, we're on TV with Prezal, we're on TV with Experio, and we're on TV with Transitions. We're trying to drive the consumer into your offices, and I hope you'll see some of those ads. I hope you like them. I love your, your feedback on, on what you think about them, but the purpose there is to drive them into where they're going to find those products, and it's pretty clear where they're going to find those products, not online. Uh, so that's important to us, and I wanted to make sure that that was clear as well. Um, so just a reiteration of the point I've already made. And number five, um, you know, I think there's some awareness of Myeline Optical, but maybe not uh, as, as broad as we'd like. Our plan is to continue to expand that. Five and a half years ago or so, we decided that this was going to continue to grow the e-commerce uh, space. This was going to be a factor for us in the future. And we created an option, an opportunity for the independent to play in this space. And as you can imagine, five and a half years ago, it wasn't a real popular decision. Today, I have to tell you, the, the why has turned into how. If I could explain it the easiest, it's not so much why anymore as how do I do it. And this is a turnkey solution that we're working very hard to expand. Uh, both in the U.S. and globally, uh, as well as in Canada, and really upgrade uh, from what we've learned now over five and a half years, uh, the offer that we could present to the independent to really offer their patients the same thing that anybody else is offering. So literally, there's no reason for them to go anywhere else. Why do we do it? Again, I, I kind of kicked this off uh, earlier with, you know, we have to adapt to this incredibly rapidly changing market. I just don't believe the right thing is to stay still, to try to continue to do things exactly the way that we've been doing it, and hope that patients will eventually realize that this e-commerce thing is not a good thing. Uh, I, I, you know, as I said, we have to make some decisions. We can't wait. I don't believe that's going to be the case. I believe they will continue to do it. We're seeing it, as I said. Read this article, The State of Omnichannel Retail. You'll see it's happening across the board. We're all doing it. We have our mobile devices. We use those when we shop to get information. And uh, the retail component of what we do in optometry is really no different than other retail components. As much as you know, I know my dad would probably slap me in the head for even calling it a retail component. The reality today, when my dad opened his practice, you know, 60 years ago, he didn't have to compete in that manner. I and mean, I've seen the evolution in the practice and how things have changed. And you know, <laughs> my father, in my view, is you know one of those quiet, optometric pioneers. Uh, remember back, way back, he suggested I kind of stop complaining about things that I didn't like in the profession and try to make a difference. He was. He was the first to let me know when he saw things differently, though, and, and I'm forever grateful for the inspiration he's given me. But that 10 years I spent in independent practice sure left a, a pretty significant uh, impact on me. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the consumers really want to stay with us. We really have to, to find a way to, in my opinion, my humble opinion, uh, to offer them both because it's really what they're looking for. And they want to stay with us to do it. They just, as I said earlier, don't feel like that's truly an option for them. So uh, for me, that, that kind of sums it up. Um, you know, I wanted to share with the group some of the immediate changes that are going to take place. Again, we're 48 hours in, so give us a little time to entrench our, entrench our feet. Uh, but, you know, we really believe that in the end, and, and look, even the skeptics, I, and I'll speak to them for just a minute. You know, what's the worst case scenario? Let, let's try this. Let's see if it works. You know, try it. Experiment in your practice. See how your patients react. When I've asked colleagues to do that, I cannot even think of one example where someone's come back to say it was a bad idea. I have had a few people come back and tell me, and this has been an interesting one, and I just want to share this, that, you know, I, I tried my online optical and I didn't sell a lot of eyewear and this has been a failure. And, and so let me just address that. What I say to that colleague is, perfect. That's great because today, an e-commerce solution to me is a retention tool. It's not a growth engine. It's an ability to retain a patient in your office who is going to look around, who's going to want to get more information online. So if you're selling, if you start a MyOnline Optical site and you're selling 30 to 40% of your eyewear online, I would suggest something's wrong. It should be kind of consistent with what we see in the marketplace. So I've heard that a couple of times, and I, this is a nice opportunity for me to share in, in a little broader way uh, why, I, why I feel that way. So, yeah, let, let me end with this, and then I'd love to take questions, and et cetera, and hear your thoughts. I've hit you with a lot of stuff, but I'm going to say this. Let's not let change get in the way of our enthusiasm for moving forward. Uh, I mean, to me... We've got to be, and I, the enthusiasm I see on, on ODY or on ODs on Facebook for our profession, the passion for our profession, I love it. I mean, I love it. That's what we need. But let's just be careful about things that are going to change us, things that are going to impact us in a different way than before, and let's not let them get in the way. Let, let's, let's try to continue moving forward. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to trip up. I'm going to trip up. I'm going to make mistakes. Give me heck for it. That's fine. But I'm going to continue to try. I'm going to continue to experiment. I'm going to continue to test. Because my goal 
is to help the independent ECP grow. Because if I can do that, then I'm going to be successful. My goal is to help all my colleagues across the board grow. Because if I can do that, I'll feel good about what, what we've achieved at Essilor, and Essilor will reap the benefits of that. Okay, great, Howard. Wow. Uh, we've, Adam is gathering the questions here, and we have, I don't know how many, the multitude. <laughs> of, so while he's doing that, Howard, could, if it's not uh, confidential, uh, can you share with us who was on the board and their so, sort of their backgrounds? Are they coming from the commercial part of optometry or the? Uh, the I'm sorry, so just group? just for clarity for me, are you talking about the advisory board that we have yeah. that advises us, or are you talking about Coastal's board? The the, the people that will advise you and how how to proceed. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, I'm a little at a loss to say should I start just throwing names out there. So let me say it this way: there are people you all know. They're people you all respect. They represent varied types of practices, an individual with one mega practice. Several individuals have multiple practices, a couple small entrepreneurial practices, uh, different age groups, young practitioners, middle-aged practitioners, more senior practitioners. I've made an effort when I came here to really look at our advisory panel and do my best. And it's hard, you know, when you're selecting 16 people. Uh, to really represent the entirety of the profession, it can be a challenge. But I got to say, it's an amazing group. We spent the entire, we spent Monday and Tuesday together really digging in. They didn't pull any punches. They told me exactly how they felt about things and then offered ways and suggestions of things we can move forward with. Some of them you've heard tonight, some of them you'll hear over the next several months, but I'm incredibly proud to be associated with this group of people. I, they probably wouldn't even mind if I threw the names out there, but I think at this point it's probably most appropriate if they'd like to let you know who they are, if they'd like to send a note in, if they'd like to, to let folks know, that's fine. But I think probably appropriate to leave it there and just say the names of these people, I would say out of the 16, about 10, 11 of them, everyone knows and loves. Gotcha. Sorry, uh, buddy, Howard. but I just feel like in some ways I'm a little uncomfortable just giving everyone's names. Yeah, you know what? We'll dig on ODY. We'll find out. <laughs> okay. homework, right? That's fair. We have our That's, ways. Yeah. Um, I bet you so, do. I bet you so, do. So, so Howard, um, so we got a bunch of questions here, but I'll, I'll start sort of at, at the most basic level. So this is a basic business question that has come up numerous times, and I was wondering if you could try to answer it, if, if at all possible. I'll do my so, best. So if Coastal is losing a lot of money, or what looks like a lot of money to us, probably not Tesla, but it looks like they're losing a lot of money. And people sort of are asking the question, well, why? You know, why buy in and, and how, what are you going to do with that? You know, how are you going to actually prevent them from losing more money? What kind of moves do you, do you think you can make that would actually help them? Yeah, that's, that's you know, insightful. Uh, somebody's doing their homework, and I think that's, uh, we'd like to see that. Um, so here's how I would address that primarily. Um, they're growing. They've had very significant growth rates. You know a little bit about their philosophy, giving, you know, what they're trying to do is build a, a spectacle side of the business, which, you know, started off in contact lenses and giving away free pairs of eyeglasses, uh, although on the surface may not seem to be a big deal. It's a, it's a pretty big deal. So their growth rates, if you take a look at growth rates, you're going to see some pretty impressive numbers, number one. And number two, let me say this. Um, there was a tremendous amount of interest uh, on the part of investors uh, to acquire this company. And... Uh, I don't want to go any further than I really should appropriately, but I'll just say this. Um, I feel good about the fact, as I looked at different companies that had some interest in acquiring this company, uh, that we have an opportunity to shape the way its future development looks. Uh, without maybe saying more than is appropriate for me to say, I, I would answer it that way. Yes, you're right. When you look at a pure uh, P&L and, and you look at their, their uh, numbers and, and the financials, it'd be easy to say this is a company that was losing money, but this is a company that has grown very significantly and is certainly very attractive as you start to get under the covers a little bit and look at you know how they've allocated their funds, where there are opportunities for that, and the huge, I, I shared some of the numbers early in this uh, presentation, the huge number of people coming through on a daily basis to be more educated, to learn more, and to buy. Right. Now, uh, here's a question that's come up numerous times as well, and this, this is a question of geography. People aren't so much concerned about Coastal as a company, but they are very concerned about British Columbia, which is perceived to have some of the least eye care practitioner friendly laws on the books, and some of the concerns that the folks at Coastal helped promote those laws. I don't know too much about Canadian law, so I, I can't really get into that, but I'm sort of wondering, you know, what do you think about that? And going forward, um, are the folks at Coastal still going to keep pushing on the, this deregulation aspect? 
So there's a lot of questions in that. Let me deal with the last one first. No. Um, and I'll, I'll answer it this way. Those of you who don't know me, and I know Paul probably knows this a little better. Um, if I go back to my Vistacon days, um, there was a major lawsuit that took place, um, class action suit, against the contact lens companies and the individuals that looked at um, you know, whether there was pricing being, being fixed, whether there really truly is an importance in an eye exam and why can't people just go in and buy glasses at a gas station. And uh, I, I would welcome anybody to go back and look in the records. I testified in federal court in that case and did my very best to present the rationale for how ridiculous that was, how important the eye exam was as it related to contact lenses, how we would be putting the public at risk. Uh, this is on the record. Anybody can take a look back at that. Uh, I can tell you that I firmly and strongly believe in that. Um, I can tell you that we will not continue to fight any legislative issues um, that uh, you've brought up here. Uh, and I can tell you, if you look at our philosophy with some of our other companies in this space that we own, I think you will see what our overarching approach is to this and how we will continue to move forward in the future. Great. And uh, I'd like to present you with a question. Question. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I'd like to present you with a conundrum. So okay. um, on the one hand, you know, the, the coastal site could actually be a great vehicle for education, as you mentioned. Um, but on the other hand, you also mentioned that some of the very high margin, high end products that eye care practitioners rely on, like Rizal, won't actually be on the site for sale. How do you reconcile those two statements? How, how can you provide the education for the higher margin products that everyone wants uh, while not being able to actually sell them on the site? Yeah, great question. So, so here, I, I think it's a philosophy we've had from the very beginning is that if you are not an independent eye care provider, we don't sell Verilux Rizal. Uh, to you. So we are going to continue to be consistent with that. When it comes to education, we are going to educate people about differences in products, about the importance of the eye exam. And I, we have no issues with continuing to drive people into independent practices to, to acquire those products. We prefer them to acquire those products there. I don't believe anybody should get very, and I'm speaking Howard Purcell right now, there may be, I don't think so, there may be some people at my company who see it a little differently, I don't think there are really. We don't believe that today effectively our products can be prescribed, Verilux products can be prescribed online. There's just not good ways of doing it. Now, let's be frank, one day could that happen? Not necessarily that we would want to sell Verilux, but that the technologies could improve to a point, maybe that could be done, I don't know. But today, I am not comfortable with that. I would not recommend a consumer get a progressive, a bifocal, a more complex prescription online. I don't believe that that's the best way to do it. So for me, it's really not a conundrum, it's very straightforward. I want to tell them that there are differences in products. It's funny, I'll, I'll tell you this one little, little piece of this antidote. Uh, we put together our Verilux commercial, which I hope everybody has seen. I, I think it's, it's pretty interesting. We're finally talking to people about progressives, and that is a term that really hasn't been, uh, been brought out there very much. But here is the, the data our, our marketing team brought to us. When asking consumers, how many progressive lenses are there out there? I was shocked by the answer. One, maybe two. Their perception was that everything is pretty much the same. So when you see the Verilux commercial, I hope you'll be pleased with discussions about fairly technical things that candidly we felt may not really resonate with the consumer and resonated amazingly well with the consumer. So we're excited. We're out there talking about progressives. We're talking about wave technology. We're talking about things that help, I hope, in the consumer's mind to differentiate for them the difference between a quality premium product that has innovation and, and and uh, you know, millions of dollars worth of innovation that really differentiates it. We're going to work very hard at that. So I hope that answers your question. I don't see it that way. What I see is we agree, I think, on this one, which is those products should not be sold online, that people should go to their eye care practitioners, that maybe I gave an example where I see maybe uh, e-commerce working well and Plano Sunwear, things of that nature, where they can, which I think represent a big opportunity for us. So. Um, I feel like it's consistent. Help me if I'm missing something, but I really feel that's a consistent philosophy. Sure. I, uh, <laughs> so this is interesting. So I have a question for you here about control. Um, you know, someone actually says that they're willing to do the e-commerce stuff, but they want to feel like they're more in control of the transaction. And I think that's a big unspoken issue that a lot of folks have. I love that. Um, no, I love that. That's that. feedback we need. That, that's constructive input that says, Okay, I'm willing to try, but here's what makes me feel more comfortable. Whoever that person is, first of all, thank you. Secondly, H Purcell at EssilorUSA.com. That's H-P-U-R-C-E-L-L. -L. 
<laughs> at EssilorUSA.com. Get in touch with me. I mean, that, that's the stuff I need to hear. You know, it's been 10 years since I've practiced a full day and seen a full day's worth of patients. I need that input. That's the stuff we need to hear. So I really appreciate that, whoever that was. And that's the kind of stuff we need to hear. How can we make it something that you'd be comfortable with? Because I've lived this for five years. A lot of folks are just trying to get themselves comfortable with it. That's so important. So, so thank you. I, that, that's the kind of feedback we really need. Sure. And uh, here's, here's an interesting question. I don't even know if this one can be answered. But um, so a lot of online commerce is associated with low margins. At the same time, we're in an environment with vision care plans that are offering their own discounting. So when you get those two, to, those two together, it doesn't sound like a very good combination. <laughs> yeah. Here's how, the only way I'd answer that is this. I want people to think, because it's taken me a while to get there, so maybe I can stop you from making some of the mistakes and the dumb thinking that I did maybe early in the game. This is another channel of trade just like any. And therefore, what you're going to find, and if you look carefully, you'll see it, even within our portfolio, that you're going to have people more expensive than you, you're going to have people less expensive than you. You're going to have dirt cheap people, you're going to have super high end people. This is just another channel of trade. So if you look at it in that manner, I think you can appreciate the fact that it's really no different. I suspect that down the block from this practitioner who asked the question, there is somebody who is lower priced, there's someone who's higher priced. And, you know, maybe other than Farkas, who probably was the highest priced of anybody, had to throw that little dig in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, you can't. God bless you for the great job you guys did there. But, no, but that's the reality. I don't mean to, to, to make, make light of it. The reality is this is another channel of trade, and this is free trade, and you're going to see folks all over the board. And by the way, the consumer is the same way. There are consumers who want quality, for example, I just used the example and carry it through, who want a quality pair of sunwear. Um, and there are people looking for the cheapest thing they can find. There are people who buy their somewhere in a drugstore, in a, in a gas station, and there are people who buy their, their somewhere in a, in a boutique. It's no different. This, this is just another channel of trade, and I think it's important, my, my again, humble opinion, that we look at it that way. You know, one of the more successful online uh, spectacle companies, uh, I don't want to mention names, but they're on ODWAR about complaints, have gone into brick and mortar. Uh, and that they, they seem to be going in that direction. Uh, so how, how will you compete against the, the, this particular company that is now opening up stores? Uh, well, there are a couple in New York City already, and I expect they'll, they'll be expanding nationally. So, how, how are you so I'll get back to my comment. Yeah, I'll get back to my comment earlier. They are clueless when it comes to bricks and mortar. Think about how we felt the first time we tried to even begin to look at e-commerce. That's about how comfortable, good, uh, polish they are. They're to me, they're entering right where we want them to go into our strength. I mean, this is an easy one for me, and maybe I'm, I'm missing something, and I'm, please point it out for me. But to me, they recognize bricks and mortar is important. That by being a pure virtual player is not going to win. It's omni-channel. It's what everyone's talking about, not so much in eye care, but in every other space. The state of omnichannel retail, Yori Worms, or if I can get you guys something that you can send out on this, I'd, I'd love people to read this. I think it's very enlightening. I've read a lot of articles. This one, to me, stands out as a real interesting one. In any case, to me, this is the, this is the sign of what, and I don't want to, this is going to sound wrong. I mean, early in the game, we thought this could probably happen. In some ways, we hoped this would happen. Because what it does is it shows exactly where the winds are going to be. The company you're talking about, and I think we all know the company you're talking about, swore they would never open up a bricks and mortar store. And you know what? They, by the way, you know, we say what we want about that company. You know, they have kind of made glasses cool, and in some ways we can all benefit from that. You know, I don't love some of the things they're doing. I don't love some of the things that some of our colleagues, you know, are doing and giving away things, etc. But they've done some interesting stuff, and one of those has been kind of made made eyeglasses cool and, I, and I, give them, I give them a lot of credit for that. But to me, that is the sign in some ways for me that reinforces the kinds of things we've been thinking about now for about five years, why we tried to create My Online Optical, why we tried to encourage the eye care community to play in this space because we believed that ultimately what will win is the combination of e-commerce and bricks and mortar, the term today most commonly used, omni-channel. And I think you're seeing that. It's a great example of that. And by the way, you know, the article will point out multiple uh, retailers, if you allow me to use that term, that are seeing this. And, and the demands the consumer is placing were no different in this particular category. Does that make sense? 
Definitely makes sense to me. How about you? Yeah, we are. Yeah. So I, I've got a, a question, Howard, sucking you back sort of earlier in your career, talking about contact lenses. Um, uh, Coastal obviously sells contact lenses. It's a big part of their business. And um, people are concerned because Coastal has very slim profit margins, as you know. Um, do you think Coastal is still going to keep sort of chasing those margins down the rabbit hole? Or can't, I mean, obviously you might not be able to speak about it, but this is a concern that people have about the company is that it's sort of yeah, just, just of the uh, discussing their revenue. Right, um, I think I understand your question, but when you say they have slim margins, what, what, define, pardon me, define what you mean by that. Sure, the Coastal is one of the companies that's, that's really helping to undercut uh, contact lens sales in doctor's offices. Um, okay, their pricing. I mean, we don't really know margins at this point, but what we're saying is the pricing that they have out there. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Okay, yeah, and this is something uh, I have to say that the advisory panel uh, was really brought to light for me. I've been focusing my attention on a lot of things, uh, namely, uh, you know, free eyewear and uh, bricks and mortar and things that, that really jumped out to me. This is something that more recently, probably in the past 48 hours, I've heard from five or six practitioners and I thank them, they know who they are, uh, pointing this out to me that they believe that Coastal is probably among the lowest price contact lens out there. Um, I'm not perfect, I tried to evaluate as much of that business as I could. That was something that, that kind of flew over me and in the three months or so since we, we mentioned something about an acquisition, it hadn't come up a lot. So I'm going to be candid. It's something we need to take a look at. I don't have an answer for that today, but in the past 48 hours, this is the fifth or sixth time now that I've heard it. Uh, it's on my radar. Uh, we will discuss it. We will take a look. We'll make some comparisons. Our goal, uh, well, I'll just say this, look at the philosophy of how we operate as a business. Say what you will about it. Essilor, we don't tend to be the lowest price out there. So. Um, we'll see. I, you know, do people want us to raise the price? I mean, you know, it's always tricky when you do that. Someone else comes in and undercuts. So many issues. You, you understand, Adam, I think very well with your MBA background. This is a delicate situation, but I do thank my colleagues over the past uh, couple of days who've brought this to my attention very clearly. It came up at our advisory panel meeting. We had some good discussion debate about some solutions for it. And what I can assure your listeners is this is a topic that will get uh, the attention of our group. And important. Let me see. I appreciate the importance of it. Let's, let's. Well, while Adam is looking, yep. I have one question. Uh, you know, the, uh, the optometrist, I, I, I learn about optometry through OD wire, and one of the great complaints is that patients come in, they, they come and they look out and they check out the frames and they take down the, the lot number and the, the size of the frame and et cetera, et cetera, and then they go online, order the frames and come back. And then they have the chutzpah to come into the practitioner and say, adjust my glasses. <laughs> right. uh, how, right. is, <laughs> uh, how is Essilor going okay. to react? So you're going to you're gonna call me nuts on this one, right? But you're going to call me nuts on this one. But I think what our colleagues have done in their response to that has had a pretty big impact. The fact that we haven't... Because let's think about it, right? When my dad was in practice, I used to go to my dad's office and someone would come in and need to adjust. Well, we never hesitated. We're going to adjust. Do because why? Because we hope that patient's going to stay with the practice. I mean, you know, I remember doing it myself, you know, fixing screws and, and uh, adjusting glasses and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, historically, it's something we always did. But sure, I mean, chutzpah, there's a lot of other words you could use for the frustration when that happens. But this is why we are where we are. And I think it's in a good place where the consumer is saying, Without that piece of it, if I, it's just a place where I can go and buy something, but I can't get an adjustment, I can't answer, get it questions answered, I can't uh, uh, talk to somebody about my needs, I don't know that I'm so comfortable buying eyewear in that environment. Candidly, call me crazy, I think that's a good thing. I think it's going to lead us to a place that's going to provide a tremendous amount of opportunity if practitioners, eye care practitioners, are willing to embrace this to allow us to really shape this channel and to show people that the best way to do it is with us. And that with us, you can go home and you can look online and you can look and, and try frames on, do a virtual trial. We offer that today. You can start it tomorrow in your practice. It gets back to something I mentioned earlier, which was this showrooming versus web rooming. Today, we are frustrated by showrooming. It's what you just described, Paul. That's showrooming. I go in there, I use you as a showroom, and I go off somewhere, I order the glasses, and then I want to come to you to have you adjust them. I mean, it's crazy, right? There's probably nothing well, maybe there's something, but very few things more frustrating than that. But what the articles and the people who are really knowledgeable, maybe you know, five, ten years ahead of us on this are saying, it starts off as showrooming, but ultimately what wins is webrooming. It gets back to this state of the omni-channel retail that I mentioned, this article, that, that really speaks to this new term, which is webrooming, meaning just the opposite. I go online, 
I do a virtual trial. I kind of narrow down to what I like, but I'm not comfortable making that purchase. I want to walk into a bricks and mortar store, have someone answer my questions, tell me if I'm right in what I've selected and what my needs are, get those glasses for me, order them, fit them to me, bring me, give me a nice case, give me some cleaner, present them to me in a very positive way and be there for me anytime I need them. We believe from the beginning that that was what's going to win and I think, I hope I've been able to show a few uh, points, a few evidence of why we're moving in that direction. Right, and let's see what time is it. It's seven ten. Oh yeah, so oh. time flies oh, when you're having fun. Time is flying, but I, I have one more. I have one more question that's, that's slight. Are you having fun? <laughs> oh, this, is, this has actually been great. You know, um, so, yeah, I'm glad you think so. One, one, I'm sure you're having a blast. Um, anyway, you know so, what? no, honestly, I've been waiting for this day for three months. I mean, we've been wanting to tell our story. This is, you know, to keep me muzzled and not let me tell some of the things that I've been able to tell tonight has not been easy. I'm sure I've been. A real miserable guy around the office here with the frustrations because I've been wanting to talk about this. And again, I would just say thank you to you all for, for the opportunity to uh, to be able to tell our story. And it's a little awkward. I'd love to hear what people are saying. I'd love them to be able to talk to me. And at the end, I'm going to give my email again. Um, and, and I hope I will hear from folks and I'll do my best to get back to you. Uh, uh, it's, it's a little awkward doing all the talking and, you know, and then not really being able to hear from everyone. I love hearing from the two of you, believe me. But um, I appreciate the opportunity. I've really wanted to do this. So yes, I am enjoying it. So, so I, have, I have one more sort of question and then we're going to be out of time. But um, so Essilor, your customers aren't actually just doctors, right? You work with labs all over the country. And, you know, as doctors might be upset by this whole e-commerce thing, it's bad. You know, the doctors might feel it's bad for them, but I'm certain that a lot of the labs are very scared by what is happening. Um, how do you feel this is going to impact your relationship with the labs going forward? Well, I, you know, my initial reaction and help me, but um, if more glasses are, are made, that's good for the labs. So if we can drive people in to get their eyes examined, the more eye exams we do, the more eyewear is being produced, and the labs are going to win. So um, I see this as a positive thing uh, for the labs, uh, that if we can continue to grow the industry, which is what really drives us, I, I'll be candid, I don't, and, and I hope it doesn't come out wrong, I don't think there's a lot of companies out there driving growth. There's a lot of companies coming in saying, you know, give us the business you're giving to that other company because they're doing this or they're doing that. I don't see a lot of companies going out to the consumer, spending money on, on programs that help to explain the importance of the eye exam. And I'm thrilled with my colleagues who've jumped on board to that. So in the end, I believe this will be to the benefit of the lab. So maybe, maybe I'm not understanding your question completely, so help me. Well, I think that, that when you see a lot of times e-commerce causes centralization, right? You get big players who then start sucking up a lot of the volume, and then that tends to drive volume towards other big players. And as you know, labs are sort of, they're, they're decentralized throughout the country, and I think that there's sometimes some nervousness around sort of these large players getting built up. Okay, got it. Yeah, I, I think that it's, it's the American way. Look, you know, you got to show you're the best lab. you got to show you're going to provide the best service, the best quality. Uh, something I recognized here that we sometimes have a disconnect of what quality of a lab means to our colleagues and what quality of a lab means to a lab. And I've tried to do my best to narrow that gap. Uh, labs are very fixated on standards and, and uh, you know, what the, the exact prescription is and where they are and where they should be. Uh, but sometimes the way that the package shows up, how the lenses look when they, when they get to the office for many practitioners is what quality is all about. So we've worked hard on that. But I think in the end, it comes down to who are the best labs, who do you have confidence in? Uh, the ones that you're going to utilize, uh, yeah, maybe as consolidation occurs, yes. I mean, there's consolidation occurring in the practices today. There's consolidation happening in the industry today. That's a phenomenon that is too big for anybody to necessarily control. Um, the reality is, though, who really controls things is the eye care practitioner. You make the decision with your pocketbook. Uh, you make the decision on who you're going to trust, uh, who you believe in. Uh, I hope we can continue to prove why we are the ones really, truly looking out for you. Um, I know for some people that choking at that, just hearing the whole idea of acquisition of Coastal and me trying to say that we're looking out for you, but I'll take it back to we can't just wait to see what happens. We have to make decisions early. Sometimes they look bad or look good at the beginning. Sometimes they look bad or look good at the end. Um, this is one I'm pretty bullish about. This is one that now five and a half years in, I feel like at the beginning we made some good decisions. Um, I feel like we're continuing to make decisions that ultimately, you know, I hope three years from now when we're on ODY and we're talking about this decision to acquire Coastal, that what we're talking about is what a great opportunity it created for the industry, that it felt painful at the beginning, it felt awkward at the beginning, 
But in the end, we prepared and worked together with the uh, eye care practitioner to offer consumers what they were really looking for. And we'll all celebrate, we'll all drink a glass of champagne. If we're wrong, we're wrong, but I'm putting my money on the fact that this is where the future will be and we need to position ourselves well and not let others shape our industry for us because some of that is happening and it makes me really nervous. You know, I don't spend my day seeing patients, so what I spend my day doing is kind of understand what's going on in the industry, reading a lot, talking to a lot of people, you know. There's guys out there trying to, to create eye exams you can do online. I want to understand that. I mean, it scares the crap out of me. The first time I hear it, my stomach turns just like yours does. I'm an optometrist at heart. I mean, I, you know, I wear two hats here, yes, and I'm not going to be Pollyannish about it. My job is to help support Essilor as a company, and my job is to make sure that the eye care provider is viewed front and center. But I'll tell you, I've got a lot of people sitting around the boardroom table with me, including our number one person who believes in that as much as I do. Okay, great. So if I could just summarize, let's see if I understand what's what's going on. Good luck with that one. <laughs> so here we go. But, you know, but, but to summarize, so it sounds like what you're saying is the acquisition was specifically for Coastal's expertise in e-commerce. And now that they're sort of part of your family, you're going to try to make some changes and adjustments to the way they operate to try to be more friendly to the practitioner. Is that a pretty fair statement? <laughs> yeah, and I would just add to that, let's talk about growth not only just to, to do these things, but to also grow this industry together and to embrace the omni-channel approach. And I would just encourage my colleagues to read a little bit more about omni-channel, to talk to me if you want me to send you this article, if there are any way we can post it on, I mean, I have no interest in the article, I've not been written in the article or anything, but I think it would be a really valuable read for your listeners, and if there's some way I could get the information to you so that they could have a look themselves, I think it will influence folks a bit in terms of how this plays. So I just want to make sure it's clear that it's about a little bit more than that, if you if you allow me. Right. So Howard, after this call is done, just shoot me the article via email, and it will be up on ODWire within 30 seconds. So yeah, fantastic. I will do that. I will absolutely do that. And let me, uh, if if, I, if you'll allow me, I'd like to give my email address one more time. <laughs> absolutely. It's your funeral. Go ahead. <laughs> oh no! Look, hey. If I don't hear from people, I can't do my job. So um, you know, I I appreciate there's some people who don't love me. Um, hey, I go home and at least my dog loves me, so that's you know that's my saving Howard, grace. But <laughs> Howard, let me tell you something. Seventeen thousand folks on ODWire have my email, and I just want to run away screaming. So, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, my job is to represent them, so you have a little different role in the thing. So anyway, it's H Purcell, H P U R C E L L at Essilor, E S S I L O R U S A dot com. And I'm going to say, please, talk to me. Let me know. There were at least a couple of the questions that were asked tonight got me thinking. And to me, that's, it's, it's worth all of that. And I appreciate the, I don't know how many folks are on the line, but I, I just want to say how much I appreciate you being on and taking your time to be with me tonight to give me a chance to at least explain our position. And uh, hopefully there's some things that you agree with and feel good about. And if there's some things you don't, let me know. I, I mean, it's the only way I can continue to do the job I'm trying to do. And Howard, do you understand we had hundreds of live. However, when are you going to be transcribing this? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I'm not even sure what, what the whole issue is if we're transcribing it or, or what, what the deal is. We'll talk to Howard about that and we'll see what we can yeah, do. But if, at the very least, what we can do is get those articles up there immediately. So as soon as we get off this call, hopefully we can get the emails going and, and get those out. Kristen is sitting here right next to me and she will make sure that that gets out to you guys immediately. And uh, it's been fun, gentlemen, colleagues. I appreciate it, Paul. You know how much I, I admire you and have enjoyed my time working with you and Adam. And uh, you know your visits here with us have influenced what we do, and we thank you for that. As you represented your group here at our board meeting, and we enjoyed that very much. I hope you'll come back and continue to give us a, a real-world view of what's going on. It's uh, it's very important for us. Sure, Great. always a pleasure. Well, thanks so much, and uh, I guess we will all talk online. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Have a great night.